So hi everyone. So we are starting the second module of this workshop, which is named Finding Overrepresented Pathways in GeneList. So this module will cover the statistical tests that are used in pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, so we are covering the statistics here because this is a conceptual knowledge that is behind all the tools that we are going to present during this workshop, as well as there are other, uh, other many other tools that are available for enrichment analysis. So we think that if you understand the theory behind it, you will be able to choose the right tool for your project and for your data. And you will also be able to interpret correctly the results uh, of the test. And after this lecture is going to be easier because we are going to use it in a practical lab and we are going to use two tools, GACA and GProfiler. So this is the list of our learning objectives. So we are going, going to learn first how to dif differentiate between a defined gene list and a ranked gene list. And then we will review the concept of p-value and false discovery rate, as well as the test that we need uh, to apply for enrichment test analysis. And at the end of this lecture, you should be able to interpret the results of the two enrichment tools that uh, we are presenting, GSEA and GProfiler. So here is how this module integrates with the full workshop. So earlier today and uh, in the pre-recorded video, Gary talked about the different gene lists that we can obtain from our omics experiments. So we start by normalizing the data to apply statistical analysis uh, testing. And then at the end of all the steps, we get the gene list that we would like to functionally interpret in an unbiased way. So that's one element. And the other element is the prior knowledge that we have about the function of these genes that are collected and stored in different pathway databases. So these two elements, the gene list and the pathway, they can connect or talk to each other only if we use the same gene identifiers. So if my gene list in the format of a gene name, then my pathway database, sh I should also use the format of a gene name. So when we have these two elements, we can perform pathway enrichment analysis, and we are looking for over enrichment of my pathway in my gene list, and this is the focus of this module. And then in the next uh, modules, we are going to learn how to visualize the results of this uh, pathway enrichment analysis. So this slide represents the uh, analysis workflow of pathway analysis. So usually our end goal is to uh, define or to find a very defined pathway that was activated or inhibited in our experimental model. So he's, here we see the PI3K AKD pathways, but usually before that step, we have extracted this pathway for, uh, from a more global picture. As we see here from the enrichment map with many pathways that were significantly enriched. And um, before to get to that step, what we had to do is to run the enrichment analysis itself. And this is what uh, we are learning in module two. So another way uh, to, um, represent pathway enrichment analysis is this one, because something, sometimes we think it's uh, complicated, but pathway analysis is just a way to organize your gene list in different categories that are biological processes. So I have the, my gene list on the left and I can organize based on the pathway. So the genes in the black would be part of the exon guidance pathway, the green genes part of aging, the purple, uh, stem cell development and cell migration. So by basically now we can concentrate on these four biological process only to interpret our data and generate new hypotheses. So pathway analysis has simplified data interpretation. And um, most importantly, we need to do that. We need to summarize into categories because we, our gene list is very large. So from the omics experiment, we got a very large gene list. If we had gotten a very small gene list, we may want to interpret it in other ways. So that's, uh, we are going to uh, here talk about one important concept that is the overlap that is used to calculate the enrichment score. 
So, um, so we have our journalists on the left that I've represented here in this uh, circle, and I have 41 genes. And exon guidance that comes from the gene ontology database is the first pathway that I'm testing. It contains in the original database 39 genes. So what we see here is that there are 13 genes that are in common between my gene list and my pathway. So 13 genes is the size of the overlap between my gene list and my pathway. So the size of the overlap is going to contribute to the enrichment score. And we can see here that uh, it's about one quarter of my gene list and about one quarter of the pathway that I'm testing. Uh, so in addition to the simple uh, concept of overlap, what we can do as well is to associate a score um, with the genes when we calculate the pathway enrichment score. So if my genes here in the overlap would have a high score that would increase the enrichment score for the tested pathway. So what we can do is to rank all our genes in our experiment using a scoring system. So for example, for RNA-seq data, that could be differential gene expression value, and for CHIP-seq and ADAC-seq, that could be uh, the p-value that is associated with the peaks that are associated with the genes. So another important concept when we do enrichment analysis testing is the background. So the background is sometimes called the universe, and it represents only the genes that could have been measured in my omics experiments. So the genes that could not be measured are, are not expressed in my cells, are not uh, part of my background and should not be counted. So an example where I have a restricted background could be a custom array. And on the array, we just have transcription gene, factor genes or immune genes. So in this case, I have to restrict it uh, to only the genes that were placed on the array. But for RNA-seq or other omics experiment, because it's a whole um, genome, then we should not worry too much uh, about the background because it represents um, all genes in the genomes. But if you want to have a, a rigorous background for RNA-seq, for RNA-seq, for example, what we do at a very early step of the analysis is to remove genes with a very low count or counts equal to zero. So we restrict the background to genes that are expressed in our cell model. So that brings us to this outline of this lecture, which describes the workflow of an enrichment analysis. So we learned that we have two different type of gene list, a defined gene list and a ranked gene list, and that the statistical test is going to be different. So a defined gene list is going to be the Fisher's exact, et, uh, Fisher's exact test, and a for ranked gene list is going to be a rank-based uh, sum test that is included in the tool GACA. But both of them will give us a value that is associated with with each tested pathway and the p-value assesses the probability that this pathway is enriched in our gene list by chance only. And then we will see later in the lecture that we are actually testing many pathways. So we need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. And we are going to learn two methods. One is the Bonferroni correction. And the other one is the false discovery rate using the benjamin Holberg method. So as I said, there are two different kinds of gene lists. And so the defined gene list would be typically, uh, would, would typically contains a fixed number of genes, for example, 200 or 500 genes that we have selected using a threshold. And for example, that would be um, genes that we found frequently mutated in a set of patients. And the question that we are going to answer to do uh, enrichment analysis is, are any pathway surprisingly enriched in my gene list? And the test is going to be the Fisher's exact test. And the ranks, uh, list is a list of genes in the genome that we are able to rank using a score that is coming out of our mix experiment. So for RNA-seq, when we compare pair, uh, two groups, let's say treated and controlled, then we can rank all the genes from top up regulated to top down regulated. And the questions that we are going to answer is, 
RNA pathway ranked surprisingly high or low in my rank list of genes. And the test is going to be included in the GSEO, GSEO tool. So why do we test in ranked gene list? So if we are able to, to test to rank all our genes, this method is always recommended because we try to avoid arbitrary threshold. Because uh, with a defined gene list, it's very difficult to know where to put the threshold to select the gene. So if we are too stringent, we are going to lose information. But if we are too permissive, we are going to include too many false positive. But the width a range list, we don't have this issue. So now, um, those are three examples of type of data where it's easy to get a ranked gene list. So the first uh, example is bulk RNA-seq, a classic um, two groups design where you have control and treated, you do your differential expression, and you rank all the genes from top up regulated to down regulated to get the rank list. And you can do it in a similar way with single cell RNA seq data. So, first you get your cell clusters and then you do a cluster one versus all the cluster, or you do cluster one versus cluster two. So, you do your differential expression. And the same way as for RNA seq, you can rank all the genes from top up regulated to down regulated. And it's also possible with label-free proteomics, if you get a sufficient number of proteins, then you can rank um, them the same, same way as you do for RNA-seq. But so how to do this ranking? So we need to learn because we are going to do it uh, in the practical lab. So let's say I have RNA-seq data. I have a matri my matrix. I have two class. Let's say uh, control M treated. And then I do my differential expression using our package like HR or DSIC2. And then I can I will rank them from top up regulated in treated, the non-significant genes in the middle. So I keep the non-significant genes. And then at the bottom of my list, I will have the genes that are down regulated in treated. So from DSIC2 and HR, I get an output table. And then you always have uh, two columns that we are going to use. One is the log for change and one is the p-value. So for the log for change, we just use the sign. We just look at the direction. We want to see if it's positive plus one, that my gene is upregulated, is going to be at the top of my rank file. And if the log for change is negative, minus one here, it will be located at the bottom of my rank file. It will be down regulated. So the formula to calculate the ranking score is sign of the log for change. That's what I explained. Multiply by minus, minus log 10 of the p-value. So um, a significant p-value is very close to zero, meaning that the uh, gene is uh, highly differentially expressed. And when I do minus log 10, I transform this very small p-value in a high high score. So in this way, I can uh, rank my file from a high score to low score. So high score for the upregulated, non-significant in the middle, and then the low score. So now that was for uh, the ranked file, and we say that it's uh, recommended. But in some, uh, in some example, it's not possible to do a ranked file. Then we have to do a defined gene list. So here are three examples where we use a defined gene list. The first is uh, when our starting point is DNA, we are looking for somatic mutations. And uh, we get at the end of our ana analysis, the list of frequently mutated genes. So this one is a defined gene list. Another example would be a time course. So we have RNA-seq uh, data. Maybe we are studying uh, developmental biology. So we have our matrix of samples with different type points in power. And in this case, what we would like to extract is different gene list based on the pattern of expression of the genes. So maybe we want to extract genes that are going up at the end uh, of the time points, or maybe genes that are going down. So in this case, we have three different gene lists that we will um, analyze independently using a defined gene list method. 
And the third example comes from Ataxic and Chipsic. So we get our peak regions and maybe we have uh, treated and controlled. Maybe we select the peaks that are specific to the uh, treated controls and then uh, we associate uh, the peaks with genes and then we get a, a defined gene list. So even if this gene list is very large, it's still a defined gene list. So now we are going to start by explaining the statistics bit behind uh, the most simple test, which is the defined gene list enrichment test. So given a gene list, given a pathway, are any of the pathway surprisingly enriched in the gene list? And we are going to learn how to define and estimate surprisingly. So here on the left, we can see the gene list. So you remember earlier, I told you that the gene list was 41 genes. And here in the, like in the brown garden, we define the background. So the background actually it's the whole rectangle because the gene list is part of the background. And the other element is the pathway. So earlier we said the pathway was 39 genes and we had this overlap size of 13 genes. But now we are going uh, to the next question. And the next question is, is this overlap larger than expected by chance? And then we are going to get a p-value out of this. And then if the p-value is very close to zero, it means that the pathway is uh, significantly enriched in my gene list and it's not due to uh, random chance. So how do we do to get uh, uh, this p-value? One way to do it is to try 1000 random gene lists and compute the overlap size for each of these random gene lists. So when we do that, we are building a null distribution. And then we will see if our observed overlap of 13 is far away from that null distribution. So when you do that, uh, you are calculating an empirical p-value and you do that by uh, calculating the number of times your observed result was larger than the uh, random overlaps divided by the number of tests that you did. And the p-value that we get is assessing the probability that the overlap between our gene list and the, pa and the pathway is observed by chance only. So a p-value can range from zero to one. If we have a p-value close to zero, there is a low chance that the results are caused by a random chance. So we can say that the pathway is significantly enriched in our gene list. If it's one, it's likely due to random chance. So zero is very good and one is bad. So the problem with the method of permutation, it's because it takes a lot of time to do the permutation. So it takes a lot of um, resource for the computer. And sometimes, like in the case of the enrichment test, we know what the distribution of the random samples looks like. So we know the, like the shape of the distribution. And in this case, uh, we know that the shape of the distribution, it's a hypergeometric probability distribution. And the test that is using this uh, distribution is called the Fisher's exact test. So then we don't have to calculate an empirical p-value, but we can have um, we calculate the p-value analytically. And this, so this is what we are going to, to see next. So now we are going to see next the Fisher's exact test because we know that we can apply this uh, hypergeometric probability distribution. And so to understand the Fisher's exact test, sometimes we explain it um, with uh, balls in a box. So here we are going to change balls to genes. So let's say our background contains 5,000 5, genes. Most of the genes are red, but 500 are black genes. And what we do is we take uh, five genes randomly, meaning we don't look at them. And then we, the results that we got is four black genes and one red one. So we know already intuitively that it's not easy to get these results because there are way more uh, red genes in the box. But what we are going to do now is uh, hypothesis testing. So the null hypothesis is that the list that we got is a random sample from the population because it was easy to get 
and then uh, if we would draw uh, it again, we would get it. So we know it's not the case. We know that uh, it was not easy to get this result. So we probably will have to reject the null hypothesis. So if the p-value is zero, it means that there is zero change that the result that we got represent the null hypothesis, meaning that the results are not due to random chance. Now, if the p-value is one, is me, it means that there are 100% chance that this result represent the null hypothesis, meaning that the results are random. So then if we have a p-value of 0, 0 0.5, which is very low, it means that we can reject the null hypothesis, meaning that it's not random. But even though we reject the null hypothesis, we still have like a 5% um, chance of making a type 1 error. So as I said, uh, so the null distribution in this case is modeled by the hypergeometric probability distribution. So we can get the probability of getting five red genes, which is 0 0.6. It's quite high because it's easy to get this result. And then to the probability to get one black gene, which is a bit lower, and then two, and then three, and so on. And the results that we got was four black genes and one red gene. So now we have to get from the probability to the p-value. So, so the probability to get this result is the probability of getting four or more uh, black genes. So we add up, uh, we sum up the probability uh, of four black genes and five black genes and we get our p-value. So our p-value here is 0 0.001. So it's very low. So we can reject uh, the null hypothesis and say that we have a significant enrichment of um, this pathway. Let's say, let's say that the black genes are the, a pathway that we are testing. So we have a significant enrichment of uh, this black pathway in our gene list. Okay, so now uh, in case you need it, you need to do it uh, yourself. And in case you have just one pathway that you would like to test, you can uh, manually create like this two by two contingency table and use, for example, in R, the fissures exact test formula. So what you need to enter, it's uh, four numbers. Uh, and the first, so the first number is K. K is the size of your gene list at the beginning. Then the second number that you need is M, which is the size of the pathway that you are testing. And then T is the size of your universe. And then the last one is X, which is the size of the overlap between your gene list and the pathway. So you enter this in the formula of the Fisher's exact test, and then you will get your p-value. So I'm showing this formula to, to you because we said that the background is an important concept. And then if you are not doing an, a full uh, genome experiment, you need to, to restrict your background. And you can see here, because it goes in the formula that it will uh, strongly affect the result of the p-value. So just be aware to be aware of entering the correct background. And also um, just to tell you that this formula has a lot of combinations and factorial. So uh, it was a very, um, it was taking a lot of resource for the computers. So people, when they built their enrichment tools, they use uh, approximation of the Fisher's exact test. So nowadays the computer are more powerful, so you, you, they can really uh, use the Fisher's exact test, but um, in many, in many uh, occasions use the approximation of the Fisher's exact test for this reason. So if you still uh, need to learn more about how the Fisher's exact test work, I really like this video from StatQuest. Uh, where uh, Josh Stormer explain uh, explain enrichment analysis using a bag of M and M's. So, like the full bags would be the universe, and then uh, the different colors would be the the, the pathway. And then we uh, we draw like I think eight M and M's, and then we got like seven blue, which is the blue pathway, and one red. And I think that the p value is going to be very low. I think. Uh, the, this path, this blue pathway is significantly enriched. 
in our data. So now we are going to apply for the next uh, three slides. We are going to try to um, apply what we've just learned because that's the goal of this lecture that you, after this workshop, you go and choose your favorite tool and you go to the output table and you're able to, to see these elements that we are just learning. So we are going to apply it right away with GProfiler, which is a web-based tool to do enrichment analysis that we are going to use right after in the practical lab. So we copy and paste our gene list and perform pathway and analysis. And this is the output table. So what we can recognize here is that we have tested a pathway one by one. They were all coming from the gene ontology database. And what is interesting in this, uh, this part of the screen where we have T for, for pathways was we just need to learn the, the vocabulary. So, so 17, would be the size of the pathway that we are testing. And then Q is for query. This is the size of our gene list, 20. And then what we see is that we have five genes that are in common between the two. So this is the size of our overlap. And U is the universe. This is the size of the background. So G profiler is taking these four numbers put it in the uh, equation of the Fisher's exact test and get this p-value. The p-value is, is very um, close to zero, meaning that the pathway is significantly enriched in our gene list. And just to note that this is the corrected p-value, but we are going to see um, this right after. So you can see that those elements, when your tool is doing um, gene list enrichment, you, you, you should see this element in the table output. And we are going to try another example with another tool called, called Enricher. And this is the output table. And we recognize again that we have a list of pathways that were tested, were tested one by one. They are coming from the gene ontology database. And the value that we are looking for are here. So eight overlap, 80, 85 divided by 230. 230 is the size of the pathway that we are testing. And 85 is the overlap between my gene list and the pathway. So my gene list was 200 here and my background 20,000. It's not in the output table because it's a constant value, but Enrichar is going to use these uh, four values to enter it in the, in the Fisher's exact test formula to get the p-value. And a third example with uh, Panther. And uh, this is the output. It's also uh, a web-based enrichment tool. And again, you can recognize the list of the pathway tested one by one. And this column here would be the number of genes in the original pathway. This one, the second column would be the size of the overlap between the pathway and my gene list. And again, Panther is going to put these four values into the Fisher's exact test to get the raw p-value that it's here. So I hope now that after uh, this lecture, you will look at any of, of the tools, look at the tables and try to find these elements. So we have finished the first part, with, which is to go through the gene list enrichment. As a last note, we are looking for over enrichment of pathway. In rare case, people are looking for under enrichment of the pathway and it's possible by inversing uh, like the labels. And as I said, sometimes you look like at the description of the tools that you want to use. If it's not the Fisher's exact test, it might be named hypergeometric test. And some uh, tools are using uh, approximation of the Fisher's exact test. Now we are going to start the enrichment test for a ranked gene list. So we've said earlier that if you can do a ranked gene list, it's really recommended to avoid arbitrary threshold. What we are going to present is the tool GACA, and GACA is using a modified kolmogorov smirnov test to, do, uh, to calculate the pathway enrichment test. So you remember your rank file? So we were able to rank our genes from top upregulated, non-significant in the middle, and then regulated at the bottom uh, of the rank file. 
and then we run GACA, which is going to see if each of our pathway is enriched at the top or at the bottom of our rank list. And then GACA will give us a p-value and a direction. So the p-value assesses the probability that uh, our pathway is enriched by chance only or not. And the small value that that says that stays, like for example here, uh, 0 0.025, uh, uh, it means that even if we reject the null hypothesis and we say it's not random, we still have a 2.5% chance of making a type 1 error. And the direction is indicated by the sign of the enrichment score. If it's a positive enrichment score, it means that our pathway is enriched in genes upregulated. And if it's a negative enrichment score, it means that our pathway is enriched in genes downregulated. So it is Mutha et al. who developed GACA in 2003, and they were studying diabetes. And what they found is the downregulation of this pathway called oxidative phosphorylation. But what was interesting is that in this pathway, the genes contained in this pathway, they were downregulated, but but only by a very small amount. So none of these genes were significantly downregulated. But when they sum up all these genes, they could find that the, the pathway was strongly uh, downregulated. So that could be captured by the GCA method and further uh, validated. Now we are going to see how the GCA running sum and enrichment score are calculated. So our rank file is here. So from top up regulated to down regulated, non-significant genes in the, in the middle. We place our rank file horizontally here. So then we have the up-regulated genes and the down-regulated genes. So then we are testing this pathway. And then we can see that the black bars here indicate the genes that are in the pathway and it indicates where they are on the ranked file. So it goes gene by gene. So the running sum, the running sum start at zero for gene one, and then you go to gene two, to gene three, to gene four. So each time a gene is in the pathway, the running sum is going to increase a bit. And if there is no gene, the running sum is going to decrease a little bit. So to form a peak like this, you need to understand that you need to have a lot of genes that are in the pathway. And then, so the running sum is reaching a peak here that we called the enrichment score. Uh, so GSE has a weight system. So the genes that are um, on the left and on the right of the rank file are going to have more weight than the genes in the middle. And it's because we don't want to take these genes, these this non-significant genes into the calculation of the enrichment score. So we can have peak on the right and peak on the left, but not peak in the middle. So this one is a zoomed image that shows us the running sum, which starts at zero. We have a gene here, the running sum increase, no gene, it decrease. We have another gene increase. And here we have like a, like a no gene. So we see the running sum decreases a little bit and then increasing again. So you have to have a high density of genes in your pathway to, to increase the running sum. So pathway can be enriched in genes upregulated, so we will have a positive enrichment score, but they also can be enriched in genes downregulated, and then in this case, we will have a negative enrichment score. So now we need to go from the enrichment score to the p-value. So we need to estimate if the enrichment score is equal or larger than the one that could have been obtained by chance only. So GACA method is doing a uh, permutation uh, to calculate the p-value. Uh, so it's going to calculate an empirical p-value. And uh, so in the case that we are using most of the time, the permutation is done by replacing genes in the pathway that we are testing by random genes. And we do like 1,000 times. So it's going to be 1,000 random pathways. 
but there is another permutation method that consists of shuffling the samples before creating the, the, the rank file. So basically we create 1000 random rank file to break a gene dependency. So for each of these method, what we are looking is uh, at the observed uh, enrichment score and how far it is from uh, the mean of the null distribution, we should be close um, to zero. And then we can calculate the empirical p-value by calculating how many times this observed enrichment score was greater than the random score divided by the number of permutation that we did. So uh, that was it for GACA. Um, just a note that um, there is another test, the Wilcoxon rank sum test that we can use uh, when we have a rank list. It's a non-parametric test and it only considers the rank of the genes. So here, for example, on this graph, we have on the x-axis the log fold change and on the y-axis the, um, the, the gene rank. And then we have this null distribution. So we have the global distribution in blue. And in red, we have the pathway that we are testing. And what we see, we see a shift toward the, the, the right, meaning um, toward higher log fold change. It means that this pathway is enriched in genes that are upregulated in our experiment. And this one is uh, an output from Panther, who is using the, which is using the wilcox sum test. So as a summary, we have seen that um, we use the Fisher's exact test to calculate enrichment p-value for defined gene list. And we, are, we can use GSEA or the Wilcoxon rank sum, rank sum test for computing enrichment p-value for rank gene list. So the last part um, of the statistics is multiple test correction. So in all the examples that we showed you, we were testing one pathway. Uh, but in fact, we are testing all the pathway that are contained in the database. So we testing all the pathway at the same time. Therefore, we are trying to test as, because we are trying to test as many pathway as possible, we also need to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. So we are going to go back to our example of uh, red and black genes. So our background is about 5,000 genes containing 500 black genes and all the other one are reds. And the results that we got was uh, four black genes and we say it's difficult to obtain. And I think the p-value was 0 0.001. So it's very unlikely to get this result, but this is only if we try it once because if we really want to get this result and we try it again and again, maybe let's say 10,000 times or maybe 1,000 times, we are going to get this result with four black genes and one red gene. So even if an event is unlikely, if you try multiple times, you may be able to get it. And that's what people mean by multiple hypothesis testing. And that's why we need to correct for the number of tests that we are making. So if we don't correct for multiple hypothesis testing, we are going to generate type one error, also named false positive. So, um, so we need to correct for the number of pathways that we're testing. And so then you can think if uh, we need to correct for the number of pathways that we are testing, then intuitively, then what you could do is to multiply your p-value nominal p-value that you got by the number of tests that you've, that you've done, the number of pathways that you have tested. And it actually exists. And this uh, corrected p-value uh, is call, called the Bonferroni correction. And the corrected p-value will always be larger than the original p-value. So if my p-value, uh, uh, original p-value is 0 0.01, maybe the corrected p-value is going to be 0 0.05. So when we use the uh, Bonferroni correction, we say that we are controlling for the family-wise error rate. It means that when we select pathway under corrected p-value of 0 0.05, so all, all 
like we have a set of pathway, we say that the probability of anyone to be type one error is 5%. So this correction is very simple, but it's extremely stringent. So it could be that you are doing this correction and none of the pathway passed the threshold of 0 0.05, but there is another method that is widely used and it's called the false discovery rate. So the false discovery, discovery rate is the expected proportion of the observed enrichment due to random change. So if we set the threshold to FGR 0.05, uh, what we say is that we expect a proportion of 5% of them to be due to random change. So uh, the method that we are going to show you today is the method, the benjamini holberg method, and the result is a Q value. So we are going to see it as a, in an example because it's just easier to explain, uh, but I would just mention the steps here. So to calculate the FGR, we first have to sort the p-value uh, of all the pathways that we got in increasing order. Then we calculate the adjusted p-value from the p-value by multiply the p-value by the number of tests. So the same as uh, the Bonferroni correction, but divided by the rank. And then there is an ad additional steps to uh, assign the Q-value Q to the adjusted p-value, but I'm going to show it to you because it's just easier to understand. And then, then we get the Q-value Q and then we can select the one, the pathway with FGR 0 0.05. So here it is. So in this toy example, we've tested uh, 53 pathways. We have here the nominal p-value ranked from the lowest to the largest. So now we calculate the adjusted p-value. So p-value multiplied by the total number 53 pathway that we are testing divided by the rank of the ordered pathways. And we get this adjusted p-value, which is already larger than the nom nominal p-value. And here, what is very important and the most important on this slide is that you see that we multiply by the number of tested pathway. So the more test the more pathway you are going to test, the larger the adjusted p-value is going to be. So the more pessimistic um, this, this value is going to be. So the more pathway you are testing, the more uh, we need to correct for that. Uh, but then, so then the next step, once I've said that, the next step is to uh, assign the q-value to adjusted p-value. So for that, we start from the bottom. So, so here it's empty and we want to assign uh, the Q values. So what we need to do is to look at the adjusted P value from the same row or the row just below. So here we don't have um, a rank below. So we just put 0 0.99 and then we go up and then we're, we want to assign this new value. So we go to the same rank 1.004 or to the rank below 0 0.99 and we choose the smallest value. So here the smallest value is here. So we put 0 0.99 here in the table and we do here the same way until we get uh, to the top. So now we have the FGR. So we would select the first top pathways because they then have a FDR Q value less than 0 0.05. So now we have learned how to do the, the correction. For sure, you don't need to, 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 to do it uh, in your analysis because it's already computed. Or if you want to compute it in R, uh, you have like a, a formula for it, but it's good to know how it is uh, done once and really importantly that you need to, uh, to multiply by the number of pathway that you are testing. And uh, so the, as you said, as we just so that the more pathway we are testing, the more we have to correct our, our p-value. So one way to decrease the, the number of pathway that we are testing to be less pessimistic in our, our corrected p-value is to filter the pathways by size. For example, to remove pathways that are less than 10 genes or contains more than 500 genes or more than 200 uh, 50 genes because like large pathway are sometimes very generic and not very informative and that's what we are going to do when we use um, GSEA. So uh, again if you want to learn more about the FDR I would uh, recommend this video from StatQuest.
So, uh, so in summary, what did we learn from this lecture? We learned that um, there is like a typical output for an enrichment analysis. So all the tools that we are using give us a table with a list of pathway that we are testing. And what we can look for is like a, a column that indicates a value related to the size of the overlap. And then a p-value that uh, assess the probability that the pathway is enriched by chance only, and very importantly, a corrected p-value. So one not to mention that many of these pathway, they can have a function that are very, very close together. And in this case, they contain genes in common, but we cannot see it uh, as it in the table. And that's why we do a network visualization, visualization to, um, to get a better uh, view of this uh, output table. So uh, we are presenting two tools, but many available tools are, ex are existing. So it, they can be web-based tool, they can be Cytoscape app, they can be a standalone application, or they can be included in some of our packages. So how are you going to do to choose a tool? So here um, we put a list of questions that might help you to do it. And so the first is, does it cover your model organism? Is there a good choice of pathway database, for example, gene ontology, reactome, are the pathway database up to date? So, and now you, you will be able to understand which statistic they use. Is it for a defined gene list? Is it for a rank list? Or is it for both options? Is the description of the statistics clear enough? Do you like the output size? And can we connect it with vector uh, network uh, visualization like uh, tools like Cytoscape? And so we have some four uh, tools for instrument analysis. And GProfiler is the one that we have chosen, and you will see why. Um, so GProfiler has a to date database. GProfiler has a good choice of database like Reactome, Go, and other ones. And we can test all this database together, but not one by one. So it's, uh, it um, increases the, the power. Um, it has a lot of model organism that we can choose from. And we also uh, can upload our uh, gene set database, our pathway database. Uh, it uses the Fisher's exact test because it's for a defined gene list, but there is an option to do um, audit query. And we can uh, uh, for sure upload uh, and restrict our background, which is very important for defined gene list. It's the web-based and an R package, and we can connect it with a Cytoscape enrichment map. Uh, for a rank list, the tool that we are using is uh, GSEA using a modified KS test. It corrects for multiple hypotheses. For the pathway database, we can use the one that they have related to MSeq, but it's for human. But what is very good is very generic because we can upload our own uh, custom database and we can connect it with um, Cytoscape Enrichment Map. Okay, so as a summary, what is the recipe for defined gene list enrichment test? So first we define the gene list and the background, and then we select the pathway, and then we run the enrichment test using the Fisher's exact test, and we correct for multiple testing, and we get our corrected p-value, we get, and then we select the, the significantly enriched pathway to interpret the data. And for rank gene list, well, the steps are very similar. First, we rank all genes, the, from our experiment, we don't remove anyone. We select the pathway and we run the enrichment test using a rank based sum test. And then we select the one with the FDR lower than 0 0.05 and we interpret the results. Um, and then the last slide, uh, some topics that we did not cover is the issue with correlation be between gene set and dependency of genes and um, some recent tools are also topology aware. So if you want to know more about these two topics, they are included in the protocol paper that was a reference in the pre-work. And, and, and that's it. So we, we went through the statistics and hope uh, you are still here. And then as final steps, 
the final tips, what I can say is to be precise at each step of your analysis, even at the earlier step when you clean and analyze your data and try to answer one biological question at a time.